Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to another Facebook Live. It is a wintry, snowy day here this afternoon. I'm in Ada, Oklahoma, doing a, a little bit of moonlighting for one of the OBGYNs down here who wanted to take a little break. So I thought this would be the perfect time to do another Facebook Live and talk about some issues that um, people have recently brought to my attention and, and questions that they've had. Um, I've tried to do something new here with this video. Um, I, I put a little poll over here on the side. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but um, you know, I hope that if you can add a question to it, or if you have an answer to it, let me know. I'd love to see if it if it works, if it does, if it you know goes the way I anticipate it going. Um, so anyway, if you don't know who I am, my name is Corey Babb. I'm a OBGYN. I practice in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and um, I do these Facebook Live videos as much as I can. I think they're a great, great way to talk about some of the questions and concerns that I see in my clinical practice and then also try and address things from a more um, individualized uh, standpoint. So. Anyway, I've had some ladies ask about um, premenopausal problems and um, also some kind of mood topics too. And so I thought that I would bring those up um, and, you know, kind of address those individually and see. Um, so, you know, first of all, I've had a lot of ladies recently um, come into the office complaining of different mood related issues overall. Um, and you know, when you think about kind of mood as it relates to the menstrual cycle, there's kind of this idea, you know, that we kind of colloquially know as uh, PMS, premenopausal, um, you know, syndrome. And basically what that is, or excuse me, premenstrual syndrome, not premenopausal, Ooh. Um, premenstrual syndrome basically, you know, is kind of when people think, oh, I get angry, I get irritated, I get really frustrated close to my period, um, you know, maybe I'm not the most fun to be around with, or I, you know, kind of make people mad at me or whatever it may be, but with the start of the period, all those symptoms tend to go away. And what we know causes PMS um, is a change in the amount of estrogen and also in um, some of the other sex hormones that are going on prior to the onset of menses. So remember that if you um, think about the menstrual cycle, and you look at that um, in a, a chart form. You know, let's say we'll take a 28-day cycle, which you know is quote-unquote average, and whoever that may be. Um, if you divide it in half, you get ovulation. And ovulation is when the egg is released from the ovary um, and is hopefully going to be fertilized, and a new uh, pregnancy can occur. So. Prior to that, you see kind of a, an increase in the hormone estradiol. It kind of spikes up a little bit and then falls. And then that kind of decrease in that estrogen causes the release of a hormone called luteinizing hormone, which causes the ovary to release an egg. Um, now, following that, there is a little bit of an increase in estrogen too, and it kind of goes up in the second half of the cycle called the luteal phase. Um, and also a hormone called progesterone climbs up high as well in that portion of the menstrual cycle. And those two kind of sit around in a nice hum. Um, but about a few days prior to the start of the period, especially if no fertilization or no pregnancy has occurred, what happens is both of those hormones really start to drop. And it's that sudden decrease in the amount of those hormones that, what, that leads to a lot of PMS-like symptoms. Um, now, you know, if you look at how neurochemistry and brain chemistry is affected by estrogen, it's really fascinating. We know that there are um, a lot of long chain polypeptides that are kind of like little building blocks of the estradiol hormone that have receptors within the brain itself. And what those receptors do is as they get plugged by the estrogen and the progesterone, they se help secrete um, a combination of neurotransmitters that cause us to feel a certain way. Um, one specifically being serotonin. Um, serotonin, if you've heard me talk about before, um, is kind of a feel-good hormone. It makes us, you know, kind of stay smooth and mellow, and a lot of antidepressant medications work on that by preventing the uptake of um, serotonin in the brain itself, and those are kind of your medications like Prozac or Effexor or things like that that are um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now, some of those will also work on um, another type of hormone called um, norepinephrine, 
Um, and um, those kind of work together um, in, in a way to, to, to create that good feeling mood overall. Now what happens a lot of times um, in women that are more prone to PMS is that those long chain polypeptides that the estrogen molecules are made of, either their receptors get down regulated or they don't go in and um, they're not filled as much. And so you have this sudden emotional change. And that emotional um, change is due to the fact that what those hormones which were normally being secreted in a good amount have gone away. And so now you're left with a sudden def you know, defect in the amount of, say, serotonin or norepinephrine, and that triggers some you know, frustration, irritability, anger, kind of things like that, because you don't have that high circulating level of feel-good hormones there. Um, so, you know, with that, one of the mainstays of therapy when it comes to um, treating ladies who have PMS, and especially if it's um, PMS that is enough to cause a significant amount of distress in a woman's daily activity. So, you know, ladies that um, miss work because of it, or they have, you know, disciplinary actions taken at school or work, whatever, because, you know, that, that time period right before their, their period starts, they're so irritable. Um, you know, one of the ways that we treat that is to go in and either A, try and prevent such a rapid decrease in those um, estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, or trying to keep the circulating levels of serotonin higher. So what that means from a medication standpoint is either using birth control, um, usually in the form of some sort of oral contraceptive or something along those lines, to keep those um, sex hormones at, at more of a stable state as opposed to a rise and a fall, or um, flipping that around to something like Prozac or um, you know Lexapro or some of the other SSRIs. And what that does is it goes in and it kind of falsely triggers those receptors in the absence of estrogen, and so you don't have that sudden drop. Now, if you take PMS, and we sometimes will see ladies that come and they say, well, you know, I've been told I have PMS, but they think there's something more to it, and you kind of extrapolate that a little bit more to more this more severe symptoms, you'll end up a lot of times with a condition called PMDD, or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, what that is, basically, is a form of PMS that then has gone and kind of mutated into a um, overt mental disorder that causes intense distress, intense, uh, sometimes anxiety, depression. Um, you know, I had a patient one time that said she wanted to just hide in a closet until her period started. Um, a lot of these ladies will develop significant agoraphobia. They didn't want to be out, in, you know, in, in open spaces. Um, and, you know, if you hear of, of women that may have a little bit more, um, either homicidal tendencies or things along those, and they say, oh, it's hormonal, it's PMDD. And there is such a huge shift in those hormones that it almost causes an unbalancing of, of the brain and leads to a lot more hormonal distress. Um, you know, either way, with PMS or with PMDD, the um, line of therapy still is roughly the same. You either are trying to address the hormonal issues to try and keep them from fluctuating so much, or you're trying to address the actual neurotransmitters themselves and trying to keep them from um, not being released. Um, so, you know, what do you think about that? Have either, you know, I'm going to try and make this maybe a little bit more interactive and kind of see. Um, so feel free to, to write questions or comments or anything like that. Um, you know, if you've had, if, you know, if you've known people that have suffered from these conditions, you know, how have they dealt with it or how have you dealt with it? You know, leave me um, some comments below and, you know, we can talk about those. Um, some of the things that we also see, you know, and I've talked about postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety before, um, but those are things that, you know, can persist for up to an, uh, a year after delivery. So even if a lady has, you know, been, out in um, the you know the the non-pregnant world for six months, um, and she starts to develop these symptoms where she doesn't want to get outside of the home. She doesn't want to go and get involved with you know activities that she normally did or things like that. Something we really have to you know um, 
address is, is this still a, a facet of that postpartum mood disorder? Um, and, you know, it, it's really interesting because a lot of these symptoms don't, you know, I think honestly, and I think I may have said this a couple times ago, depression as a mental disorder, I think we will see a change in the nomenclature in, as if the years go past. Because when we think of depression, you know, if you picture your kind of average depressed woman or depressed man, depressed person, whoever it may be in your head, you know, what do you think? Like, what are they like? Are they sad? Well, yeah. You know, you see these commercials for antidepressant medications, and it's like this person walking around with a little rain cloud over their head, and they're like, oh, I'm so depressed. And, you know, you have sad violin music in the background and things like that. But the fact of the matter is, depression and whether that's from major depressive disorder, postpartum depression, antipartum depression, you know, whatever it may be, it is not just a disease that presents with sadness. There are so many other aspects of it. You know, there's a feeling of um, not wanting to be, you know, not wanting to do the things you enjoy doing. There's appetite changes. There's, you know, sexual changes. There's, there's um, sleep disturbances. So you can't just say that, you know, depression is just, I'm sad. And so, like I said, I think in the future, we'll see a change in the nomenclature, I hope we do, to something that's kind of more inclusive of that, you know, whether it's gonna be kind of a combined mood disorder or something, I don't know, um, but something kind of along those lines. Um, is it common for PMS and mood swings to become more dramatic the closer to menopause you get? Yes, exactly, it's true. And, you know, the reason that we think of that is because, remember, those, um, sex hormones are going in and those long chain, long chain polypeptides are going and filling those estrogen and, and progesterone receptors in your brain. Well, as a woman approaches menopause and you start getting into that perimenopausal um, transition, what's going on is the ovaries are kind of like, you know, I know I'm going to be going on vacation here in a little bit, but I probably should give a decent last ditch effort before I, you know, go into full blown vacation vacation mode, which is menopause. And so they start sending out these surges of hormones, you know, not just this kind of normal steady state, but you get this like, bam, high estrogen, then that falls, and bam, high progesterone, then that falls, and all of these kind of highs and lows, and highs and lows, and so as you can expect, someone who may have had a little bit go up, and then it kind of goes down, now they're getting hit with these huge peaks and valleys, you know, those symptoms are going to be much more significant. And so that's actually why one of the first menopausal symptoms we see outside of the vasomotor stuff like hot flashes and night sweats and things like that is our, our mood disorders. So our mood changes and irritability exactly down here too. Um, you know, and so obviously if you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, well, what can be done about it? You know, uh, I don't want to take medication. I don't want to go on, you know, um, antidepressants or I don't want to go on birth control or things like that. You know, how can you um, address those um, symptoms? Well, you have to look at it from a kind of a multimodal approach. So first of all, you know, we know that those neurotransmitters, that serotonin and, and dopamine, and, and which is another type, um, are really what is kind of interplaying together to cause us to have you know, a, a good mood, if you will. Serotonin is keeping us kind of relaxed and keeping us you know, chugging along, and dopamine kind of elicits you know, activities that um, we want to do. It makes us want to do things. You know, now, dopamine, when it's in too high of an amount, can lead to um, obsessions or can lead to addictions. And so we know that you know, people that are, say, addicted to tobacco, when they smoke a cigarette, you know, they get that dopamine surge from smoking that cigarette, and that's one of the things that leads to um, the um, kind of them wanting to do it again and leads to that addiction. So what are some things then that you can do to kind of mimic that dopamine and that serotonin release that could potentially help mitigate those symptoms? Um, so obviously, if you're looking at, you know, dopamine by itself, doing activities that you enjoy then promotes that release of dopamine. And we know that things that are active activities, such as exercise, you know, playing games, um, and I don't mean like video games or computer games, unless you're jumping around all the time like I did when I was a little kid. Um, you know, but if you're doing, um, yeah, working out, exactly, things kind of along, stuff like that will cause a release of dopamine. 
Um, and that's why you see people that are, you know, marathon runners or that get a runner's high from it or an exercising high because they are getting a flood of dopamine. So if you are starting to notice that as your, you know, um, period starts to approach, you become more irritable, more um, frustrated, more, you know, less short tempered. Exercising is actually one of the best things you can do. Now, to flip that around and kind of go on the serotonin aspect of things, you know, thinking about activities that put us into a state of relaxation or mindfulness. So, you know, meditation, yoga, you know, vacations, um, you know, things like that can all kind of promote that serotonin aspect of uh, in our brain as well, that serotonin release. You know, some people talk about certain dietary supplements and things like that, um, you know, uh, or from the herbal standpoint, you can look at things like um, St. John's wort, um, kava kava, um, and some of the other, um, you know, kind of herbal substances that are um, known to, to cause those effects. Now, I am not an herbalist. I'm not going to talk about things from a, an ex expert point of view on that. Um, and the only kind of caution I will give you with that is that remember herbal supplements, especially if you are using them as a medication, quote unquote, still can react with other medications. You know, St. John's wort is one of the ones we know definitely um, can interfere with other medications. So really check and see if you're going to start using that as a supplement to make sure, you know, it's not going to react with some of your other medications. Um, let's see here. Is a mood tracker app helpful for, for me as a doctor to help pinpoint a wo woman's mood swings and whether they're from PMS or other mood disorder? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, definitely, you know, and there are a bunch of, of mood tracker apps or even just kind of physical health tracker apps. You know, there's stuff to see, like, what does your poop look like today? Um, you know, and, and kind of, and so you can follow that. And so as you as a person are gathering data and trying to figure out, well, why am I acting like this? That's actually one of the best things you can do. You know, a lot of them are free. You go in, you say, well, today I'm feeling kind of grumpy and today I'm feeling great. And today, you know, I had diarrhea or whatever it may be. Um, and then you can kind of correlate that, especially if you're using a period tracker, which I recommend you doing as well. And you can really kind of see how they interact. And so if you're noticing a significant change in your symptoms as your period approaches, it could be something to kind of focus into. Hormonal headaches prior to menses, even while on bioidentical progesterone. Okay, so definitely. So now remember, when we're looking at, at bioidentical, the term bioidentical is a marketing one, not a medical one. So, and we've talked a little bit this, about this before, but it's always something I want to bring up. So, um, you know, we have FDA approved, you know, bioidentical hormones that um, are just as effective as, you know, bioidentical ones you may find in, a, in a, a compounding pharmacy or something like that. So that's just my little caveat with that. You know, hormonal headaches is really interesting. Um, and I have a really good friend of mine who has really bad menstrual migraines. Um, probably some of the worst menstrual migraines of anyone I've ever seen. And the reason that we know that, the reason that affects is once again, goes into that effect with estrogen and progesterone. Um, so those sex hormones also work on our vascular system, right? And I'm pointing to my head because we're talking about headaches, but obviously you have blood vessels everywhere. Progesterone specifically is a smooth muscle relaxant. And so if you kind of extrapolate that to blood vessels, what that means is that it can cause more vasodilation. And so one of the things that we see in headaches um, especially migraine type headaches is a kind of a, a almost a uncontrolled spasming of the vasculature. So you're getting very focal areas of ischemia. And I, it's not even really ischemia, but maybe vascular congestion is a better term um, in that area, which causes pain. You know, if you think about it, if you have a blood vessel in your hand, let's say, and when it gets cold, those blood vessels whoosh, contract down, contract down really tightly. Well, what happens? Well, you can get some numbness and pain and tingling in your hands. You know, there's a condition called Raynaud's phenomenon where um, women and men have that and different parts of their body actually turn white. They blanch because the blood vessels have this kind of uncontrolled spasming. And so you're reducing, reducing blood flow to that area. Now there's enough collateral circulation. So you're not getting like the effect of say, if you, uh, you know, were losing blood rapidly or something like that, but it's enough to cause pain in the area. Um, could that affect vision? Oh, you better believe it. Um, and so that's why, you know, you sometimes will see those kind of um, menstrual migraines having um, 
oral, com or not oral, ocular <laughs> components too. Um, and so you get ocular migraines that occur around your period as well. It's all due to hormones, you know. I mean, honestly, I think the vast majority of the problems that we have are, can you can pinpoint on some sort of hormone in one way or another. Um, <clears throat> but especially reproductive hormones and women having such a fluctuation in those hormones throughout the, their cycle can definitely lead to that. Um, so if you are taking a uh, bioidentical progesterone or you're taking progesterone supplementation at all, something that you may see is that as that, if that progesterone is, a, is in a high enough amount, you will start to notice some um, smooth muscle dilation. Um, and so the other thing it does, it kind of slows down contracture through smooth muscle. So that's why ladies, let's say for instance, who are pregnant have really bad acid reflux. The esophageal sphincters, that prevent acid, stomach acid from going up under their throat. Well, because their progesterone level is really high, it causes a loosening or a relaxation of those muscles. And as such, they get this acid reflux. So same type of thing in your brain if you're on hormones, um, especially progesterone, um, you know, may cause those blood vessels to kind of have dilated a little bit more, be more relaxed. And therefore, you may have some more sluggish flow through there. Um, so yeah. So um, thanks for all the questions, by the way. It's great to be able to kind of fine, you know, tune these. And I've been following my, this little interactive poll that's kind of new. It's kind of fun to see the numbers pop up on there. Um, I'm getting a dopamine surge from watching the interactive poll. So there you go. Thanks for contributing to my mental well-being. Um, so, you know, something else in, in talking about these kind of um, pre-menopausal changes to kind of go back into that question earlier um, you know, so we've talked about menopause before, um, and, you know, menopause in the United States is noted as, or is considered, you know, the absence of menses for one year. Like, that's the official definition. Average age is between 51 and 52, depending on who you read. But you can have menopause occur naturally for a decade prior to that age and it still be considered normal. What I mean by that is you can have ladies go through menopause in their early 40s and it still be considered a normal physiologic event. Now prior to the age of, of 42, you know, you're typically looking at um, some autoimmune conditions such as premature ovarian insufficiency where the ovary is like, peace out guys, I'm done. I'm going on vacation a lot earlier than it than it normally would um, due to the body just kind of attacking it on its own. So, you know, in the same way that you start to see a lot of those um, pre-menopausal mood changes, you know, like with the premenstrual mood changes, but affecting in higher severity or higher intensity, so too will you start to see some of the other menopausal changes um, occurring in that pre-menopausal time period. So what I mean by that is you may see women or, you know, I definitely see women that come and they say, well, I'm in my, you know, early 40s, but I'm having hot flashes. What the heck's going on? You know, or I'm um, starting to experience some vaginal dryness when I'm, you know, 42 or 41 or sometimes even earlier in that because we know that that climacteric phase or that time period when ovarian function is starting to decrease can occur for you know many years prior to the onset of overt menopause itself. Um, and so when you're looking at that, you know, you really have to kind of look at these symptoms and see, okay, well, what's going on with it? Is this something that's menopausal or is it something else that is that is causing these you know changes? Um, so first of all, you know, let's say a lady comes into the office and she's in her early 40s and she's like, hey, I'm starting to have you know some hot flashes. Um, you know, I've noticed I'm getting a lot moodier, my sex drive's not where it wants to be, um, and I just don't feel as good as I used to be. You know, what's wrong with me? Am I going through menopause? And I've had this, you know, this patient come in in a variety of different presentations before. Um, and so obviously, you know, one of the first things we do is say, well, that could be menopause. It'd be a little bit earlier, you know, than normal for it to start. So we need to kind of investigate it further and really see what's going on. Now, outside of hormones, a lot of other medical conditions and or medications and or diets and or lifestyle modifications can cause those same um, kind of symptoms. You know, I um, had posted a, a post, I think earlier this week, talking about um, how different things like yoga and mindfulness and stuff like that can affect, um, help reduce 
menopausal symptoms um, for specifically vasomotor symptoms, like the hot flashes, and women that do that. And I mentioned in that post that, you know, in other parts of the world, menopause or women who go through menopause do not show up for the same type of symptoms. You know, there are some countries where the incidence of ladies presenting to the gynecologist for menopausal symptoms is one to two percent. And people have hypothesized that that is due to the fact that that menopausal transition is seen in a much more positive light in those countries. Um, you know, to whereas it's, you know, you're aging, you're now the quote unquote wise woman. Um, and in doing that, you know, you have stepped out of that realm of the reproductive age and now you should be a figure that is, you know, respected and given, um, leeway and all of these things, you know, in, in the United States, unfortunately, we view aging in a very negative um, light, you know, and, and so as we age, we're unfortunately a lot of times considered a burden to those around us as opposed to being lauded for our wisdom and our experience and things like that. And so it only makes sense then that here in the U.S. we would experience these menopausal symptoms with a lot more trepidation and, you know, seek out therapy to try and kind of retain our youth if you think about it in that way. Um, and so, you know, with that, like a lot of you kind of expressed a, uh, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I've had hot flashes. They stink. You know, I'd never want to have them again. And, and I agree. You know, like I had said, you know, I think it was an antibiotic I had or something one time that, um, you know, caused the, um, you know, like that caused me to have hot flashes. Um, and I was like, this sucks. It's terrible. Um, but, you know, so obviously there are other things like in that example, you know, that can be causing those symptoms like the, you know, like antibiotics are a good one. Um, you know, obviously lifestyle changes. If you're out and you're working in very hot environments, you may be having hot flashes and it may have nothing to do with hormones. I once was seeing a lady who worked out with a boiler, like in front of a boiler uh, furnace or blast furnace, excuse me. And she was like, why do I get hot all the time? You work by blast furnace. It's pretty straightforward. You know, she stopped working there, and lo and behold, she stopped getting hot. It was amazing. It was a cure. Um, let's see here. How does the number of children you have affect how early you go through menopause? Potentially. Now, the thought with that is that, you know, if you are, if you think about your ovaries, and every time you ovulate and every time you release an egg, they're going through a change, um, you know, that may lead to a potential of the ovary kind of petering out earlier than, than usual. You know, there's not a direct causality with that. Now, some people will say, and if you look at the data, childbirth, having a lot of children actually um, is protective against ovarian cancer. And the reason with that is because if you are pregnant, you are not ovulating. And so, you know, you're not getting that same cellular turnover every month with, with your ovary there. Um, so is having the number of children, you know, especially if you have had a lower number of children that may equate to a earlier age of menopause, just because your ovary has gone through so many transitions and has been, you know, expending its, its eggs at a higher rate than someone who's had multiple children. Now, obviously there's a very strong genetic component to this as well. You know, we know that on average, um, women, you know, if you look at the number of eggs they have, it kind of decreases incrementally through these specific lifetime markers. And a woman on average will have around 400 periods in her lifetime, you know, excluding pregnancy. So if you are pregnant, let's say you have, you know, a child every two years, well, you know, that's an extended time period, especially if you're breastfeeding on top of that, you're not ovulating and therefore your ovaries are just kind of chilling out and not doing a whole lot. Um, so could it affect it? Yes, potentially. Is, can I say if you have one child, it will go, you'll go through menopause five months earlier than if you have two versus if you have three and da, da. No, I can't give you a specific number for that. So the bioprogesterone is not the answer for menstrual headache. I guess what my question is, I'm going to figure out how to lessen that vi vi vasodilation of the blood vessels. How does a woman deal with the root cause of the vasodilation and get relief from the menstrual headache? This happens to me every month and it's miserable. I'm 41. Well, so obviously headaches can be a entire topic on their own to talk about. Um, and so you really do have to look at, so is it a, you know, is it a vascular type headache or is it something that is more muscular too that we also know that with our period um, or with, you know, periods, pain sensitivity goes up. 
you know, our tolerance to pain is actually reduced quite a bit. And so it may be that those headaches pop up with more of a higher intensity closer to your period, you know, because of that as well. Um, the medications, you know, if you're looking at stuff from a more vascular standpoint, looking for more, you know, medications that are actually working on the blood vessels themselves, you know, if you have high blood pressure otherwise, you know, you may want to look at some other things like that are, uh, say, calcium channel blockers or things like that, uh, Procardia and Ifedipine as a potential way to kind of cause that vasostabilization. Uh, the other thing, you know, some people get a lot of, of benefit from Botox, actually, um, for menstrual headaches, too. Um, I said, you know, that's, that's a, a topic to talk about on its own. Um, obviously, from a hormonal standpoint, women that have menstrual migraines who have auras with that, so they see spots, dots, things like that, should be very cautious about using estrogen containing um, oral contraceptive pills because you have the potential for an increase um, in, in strokes with that. And that's because estrogen causes more vaso uh, or it's, it's um, more clot forming. It uh, makes us kind of makes clots form more easily. So if you already are having some vascular spasming, vascular dilation that's causing that type of migraine, um, then it's something you should, you know, be cautious about using estrogen for. Um, does, yeah, bright sparks and blackout spots. Yep, those, those are called scotomata, or the actual medical term for those, and you got it. So does birth control affect pregnancy like like for period count? So yeah, so and that kind of in that same same you know fashion that once again if you are on um, you know birth control for a long time that is protective against ovarian cancer as well because um, you know you're preventing that cellular turnover that happens every month um, with the with the ovary with a normal cycle. Um, so, you know, so, so yes, if that's kind of what you're talking about, yes, it definitely can. Can vitamin D deficiency affect the mood? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so, you know, if you look at vitamin D, and this is, there has been this huge influx of vitamin D related stuff over the last few, you know, years. Um, you know, do we have a vitamin D deficiency in this country? Well, if I look at the people that um, are, you know, having that come in and that we check vitamin D on, the vast majority of them are deficient. Now, clinically, vitamin D can manifest as, you know, decreased mood, decreased sexual desire, kind of sluggishness, and it definitely goes hand in hand with thyroid disorders. So women who have thyroid problems, specifically low thyroid, should definitely be watching their vitamin D levels and seeing. But if you take this vitamin D aspect and you throw it back a few, you know, 100 years, even 100 years, or in other parts of the world, vitamin D deficiency manifests in kids as a condition called rickets, which is a problem with the actual bone development. So, you know, are we all really vitamin D deficient? Well, you know, I guess in a severe way, you know, I, I, we don't really see rickets that much. You know, I've personally never seen rickets. Um, yet all the tests come out, or almost all of them come back showing that we are vitamin D deficient. So it's kind of interesting, you know, are we creating something, have we created a test that makes us all deficient and therefore we all need supplementation? I don't know. Now there's kind of a question for your, you know, kind of medical, you know, ethics. And obviously if you look at vitamin D, like where are we getting, you know, most of our vitamin D that we get is, is solar in nature, right? You're out in the sun and you are absorbing it and there is a, and I forget the exact, you know, um, parallel that if you're above, you should be on vitamin D supplementation. Maybe if someone knows that exact number, maybe they can put it over here in, in the comments. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a basically saying that if you're fair skinned and you are of, you know, Northern European or Celtic descent or something like that, you should be on vitamin D supplementation. I mean, my vitamin D has always been low. You know, here's someone who is nine, um, you know, here's another one that's non-existent. I mean, I think most of us, if you took a poll, maybe I should make that poll. Is your vitamin D low? And I think almost everyone would say yes. Um, you know, so if everyone is low, is, are we really low? You know, that's like saying everyone is special, so no one is. That's just kind of my thought with that. So, um, you know, so if you, I mean, I take vitamin D supplements because mine are low. I take, a, you know, 50,000 IUs twice a week. Is it done a lot? I don't have rickets. 
<laughs> that's good. Um, you know, so um, see, here's one who's 92. Well, there you go. You don't, you're not going to need it. Um, so, you know, here's, here's a question. Ocular migraines with ORS, is the estrogen patch okay to use with these? So now here's a, an interesting take on this. So transdermal estrogens versus oral estrogens um, have a very different mechanism of action. And that's because your oral estrogen, your oral contraceptive pill, is metabolized um, through your liver, and it undergoes what's called um, first-pass metabolism. That's why a lot of medications that go through that have that interaction with other medications. You know, you may see, like, um, certain antibiotics will interfere with birth control pills. Or if you drink grapefruit juice, that will cause problems with certain oral medications. Well, transdermal medications, especially transdermal, um, you know, patches that we use for hormones don't have that same first pass metabolism. So there's not that same um, kind of risk. And if you look in the Women's Health Initiative, which is a study looking at hormone replacement therapy, um, you know, that was done over multi years, you know, what they found is that there were specific, potentially adverse events in women that were taking oral estrogens. They didn't look at any type of patch or, or injectable or transdermal, anything like that. And since that time, the North American Menopause Society has come out saying that transdermal hormone therapy um, really does not um, you know, bring with it the same risk that oral hormone therapy does in terms of kind of those you know, events. So I think, and, and that thing, we should be fine with that. Um, so something that I, I've also seen kind of recently um, is looking at um, the mood disorders, the amount of depression or anxiety um, that I'm seeing in stay-at-home moms. And this is something that I think is a really important topic, and you know I may talk about it more at another time, but I really think that this is something that we are – you know, I'm going to get up on my soapbox here a little bit. We as a society are sucking towards stay-at-home moms. You know, we, uh, you know, I've got two daughters. Their books that they have, you know, are like, I can be anything I want. I can be an astronaut. I can be a doctor. I can be um, a lawyer. I can be a scientist. I can do all these things. But then, you know, and they go to school and they go to you know, college and they get these degrees and they do all these things and then the next step is they want to be a, you know, they want to start a family and get married and then they have kids and boom, what do you do? Do you stay at home with your kids? Do you pursue your career? How do you balance that? You know, how do you take that dichotomy to where you are a professional woman and you are a mother and how do you make them both work well? You know, my wife and I were actually talking about this, you know, last night about how a lot of moms, it seems like, you know, when they're going through college and they're doing these things, and they don't realize that, that they want to stay at home with their kids when they have children. You know, and I think, and I, I totally agree with that too, and they don't know what to do. And I think there are other women that I've seen personally that say, I love my children, but I really want to do what I want to do. I want to go and I want to have my career. But, you know, if I do, I'm looked down upon. My family kind of abandons me or maybe hopefully not abandons, but, you know, kind of like shuns me. And unfortunately, you know, we live in a part of the country or I live in part of the country where I still see that happening, which just makes my blood boil. You know, the, and there's not that respect. And, you know, like looking at, at being a stay at home mom is not seen as a valid career choice which is crazy, you know? Um, if you want to stay at home with your kids, fantastic. But you shouldn't be, you know, looked down upon if you either, A, decide to leave your career to be a stay-at-home mom, or if you decide to go and do your career and still have children. So, you know, here I am. I'm in Ada, Oklahoma. I'm working. You know, it's been a pretty nice shift so far. My wife is at home with our three kids. She owns her own business. You know, I give kudos to that woman so much for all that she does. And, you know, is she's just a, a phenomenal example of what I think, you know, mom should be um, and a wife should be. Um, 
but you know, she was saying, you know, it, it's crazy. I don't have to worry about going out and, you know, how am I going to balance being a, a dad and a working professional? You know, it's kind of just um, kind of considered the norm that, well, you know, I go to work and yep, I'm a dad and yep, I'm a husband and I do those things, but I don't have to worry about it. You know, she has to try and balance all these things. So I think that we really need to do something about that as a society. And I'm not sure what we need to do, but we need to do something. Um, you know, because not only is it unfair for our daughters to be, you know, saying, here, do all these great things, go change the world, but when you have kids, no, you can't do that. You know, and or on the same vein to be like, you know, what? Why do you want to stay at home with your kids? You know, you need to be working. You put all this time in. Like, you know, it's, I think it's a problem. I don't think it's something that we can, you know, to solve here in a Facebook Live thing. Um, but anyway, sorry about that uh, soapbox. But I really, like, for those of you that are stay-at-home moms, I salute you, you know, for doing what you do. It's it's amazing that what you do. And to go through and have to, you know, either make that choice or to, you know, whatever you're doing, like, your job is infinitely more, infinitely more difficult than mine. I will tell you that. So, anyway. Um, there's a question up here. Ended a four year breastfeeding journey, two kids and three pregnancies. Congratulations. Can ending breastfeeding cause hormonal changes if I'm also on Nexplan? Oh yes. So, um, so here's the thing. So remember now, if you have been a patient of mine or if you are a patient of mine and I have had the, the joy of delivering your baby and you come in for your postpartum visit or your well woman exam after delivery, and you're breastfeeding, I will usually comment on, you know, on the nature of your vagina when we're doing our exam. Because breastfeeding is fantastic and it is wonderful, but if you want to know what your body will look like when you are menopausal below the belt, that's what breast, breastfeeding is your view in, um, you know, into the future. And Lindy, of course you can, that's fine. Um, so, you know, what's going on vaginally alone with breastfeeding is that as prolactin, which is required to lactate, it promotes lactation, prolactational, prolactin, really creative there. Um, you know, what it does is basically it downregulates estrogen. And as such, if you have a high prolactin, your estrogen level is low. And as Sarah Beth put it here, your vagina ends up looking like a 40 or a 70 year old woman's vagina. And it just is the case because as those estrogen levels decrease in that vaginal tissue, it begins to, the medical term is atrophy, whereas it stop, starts to lose elasticity. The moisture, like within the cellular level itself, decreases. The tissue becomes much thinner, less flexible, and, and can tear. And so from a hormonal standpoint, you know, vaginally alone, breastfeeding does that. Now, we know that after around six months or so of breastfeeding, that estrogen level starts to kind of climb back up, but it's still not going to change as much as, um, you know, what it does when, um, you know, you finish breastfeeding altogether. Now, if you go, if you are breastfeeding for an extended period of time, you are absolutely correct in that you're going to have those hormonal changes. Um, but the other thing to, to think about with that, um, you know, not only, you know, when you stop is that, now you're going to be getting a, an increase in those circulating hormones. And so you may find that your mood is all over the place because your body has been used to a, a more or less deficient state over the last, you know, multiple years. The next planon, which is an adrenogestral, a progesterone um, implant that goes in your arm here, is doing progesterone only. Um, you know, it's not looking at estrogen really. Um, you know, but it is um, the progesterone it, that it's giving is really not going to be affecting your mood or those other hormonal changes that much, uh, say estrogen level would. And the way that that progesterone is working from a menstrual side or standpoint is that in that latter half of the menstrual cycle after ovulation, your progesterone level is, is higher, right? Remember, that's kind of what we had said earlier um, in the video. And so what the next one on is doing is it's kind of causing this false elevation in that progesterone, but it's not causing the drop. And the drop is what leads to the start of your period. 
The flip side is, if you have high progesterone or a higher progesterone all the time, what can potentially happen then is that, you know, the lining of the uterus can become so progesteronized that it thins out and actually becomes um, almost atrophic in appearance, if you look at it. Um, and so it's so thin and it's very friable. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the slightest trauma can cause it to bleed. It's kind of like you have a skin knee on the, light, on the inside of your uterus, and anytime something rubs on it, it bleeds a little bit. And so for ladies that are on things like the Nexplanon or on some of the more progesterone-containing IUDs, um, we sometimes will see them have irregular bleeding, um, and they can sometimes get some hormonal effects from that. Um, obviously, it's something to try if that were to be the case, um, would be to give you a low dose of estrogen by itself you know, for a few days, maybe say maybe a week, 10 days, something like that, and see how things change um, with that. You know, hopefully if it's a bleeding problem, that should kind of re-estrogenize the lining of the uterus and decrease the amount of bleeding that you have. If it's more of a mood issue, then that will kind of stabilize things a little bit because remember, even though progesterone is higher in the luteal phase of the cycle, estrogen is a little bit of a lower state. So um, definitely been moody, cramping, and nauseated. Now, so the nausea goes back to the high progesterone causing the changes in our esophageal sphincter and the stomach tone like I talked about. The cramping, if you're having that kind of thinning of an endometrial lining, it's going to cause some localized irritation. And then the moodiness, yeah, because you've been kind of down-regulating some of those estrogen receptors too. So yeah, recently stopped breastfeeding slash so shop burning after seven straight years. So yeah, you know it. Um, let's see, cause of bleeding between periods. Um, so, you know, bleeding in between periods is one of those things that is extremely common. We see that quite a bit. Um, and so if you're looking at that, what you're typically seeing is what is, what is your uterus doing? From a hormonal standpoint, is it too estrogenized or is it too progesteronized? So like I said before, the progesterone basically makes everything look like kind of a very, oh, you know, skin, knee, barren, wasteland appearance. Well, the flip side is too much estrogen, especially an estrogen-dominant uterus, really looks like it's got cotton candy on the inside. It is incredibly proliferative. And what I mean by that is the gentlest breeze blowing into your uterus, which would be an odd thing, but if that were to happen, would cause parts of that endometrium or the, the lining of the uterus to shed off and for you to bleed. And so when you're looking at potential causes for inner menstrual bleeding, one of the first things to do is to look with an ultrasound and see, you know, are we too progesteronized or are we too estrogenized? If you are one of those things, then you, you know, add the other hormone to it and see what happens. And hopefully that will solve the problem. Now, there are other things that can cause really, you know, inner menstrual bleeding as well. One of the most common things is what's called an endometrial polyp. In younger women, those are almost unanimously benign, but they can um, cause problems, especially if they're there later on. And the polyp itself kind of looks like your uvula, that little hangly down thing in the back of your mouth. And if it gets irritated, it um, will cause, you know, possibly some bleeding because it typically has what's called a feeding vessel to it. And so it just kind of bleeds and sheds off, blah, 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 things like that. So, you know, that's one thing that we see. Obviously, there are other types of, of pathologies that can cause those problems like fibroids um, or um, some other hormonal things, um, you know, but, but like I said, it's something that's going to be hormonal um, or not sex hormonal. Like, so it's something that's either going to be sex hormonal, non-sex hormonal, or something anatomical with the uterus itself, like a polyp or a fibroid. So that's just kind of what you need to investigate to kind of see. So looking so far on our um, lovely little poll here, it looks like people are running next time to talk about more menstrual issues like PCOS, heavy bleeding things along those lines, or hormones. So alrighty, well, we can definitely talk about that. Um, alrighty, let's see here. Well, is there any other questions here? I know I might end up things just a little bit earlier. I've kind of said what I want to say um, about, you know, mood disorders, um, you know, the premenstrual, premenopausal symptoms, things like that. But the gist of it all is that if there is something going on, if there is something that you notice is causing you distress, if it is affecting how your day by day goes, it is worth investigating. You know, unfortunately, we see ladies that come in 
that have like had issues that have gone on for years and they're like, well, I just didn't think it was worth talking about. You know, I thought it was all in my head, you know, and even if it's something that's mental health related, so it technically is all in your head, that doesn't negate the validity of your symptoms. That doesn't negate the fact that that is your reality at that time, you know? So I've been on harm to estrogen pills for, for a week now. Would my mood still be all over place? Unfortunately, yes. Um, and that's because, you know, when obviously you're going from a kind of a, a specific state, if you were kind of on a patch for an extended period of time to now changing mechanisms and adding different medications, it can definitely cause um, some, some mood issues to happen, you know, in a short period of time. Um, but the good news is kind of with, you know, give it enough time and that will definitely get better. Um, or we can always, you know, adjust medications too and kind of see. But, you know, like I was saying, you know, your, the issues that you are experiencing as a person are not, are, are, are worth talking about and are worth investigating because if they're affecting your quality of life, you know, that's, that's enough for me to, to delve into it. Um, for, you know, so many people just ignore things. Um, thinking that they're either embarrassed about them or it doesn't really matter or however it may be in the scheme of things. Um, but really, you know, if it's giving you trouble, then let's talk about it, kind of see. So, well, um, I think that's about it for me. You know, obviously, like I said, if you have any other questions or concerns, um, feel free to send me a message. Um, be, um, you know, you can definitely share this video. If you haven't liked my page, please do. Um, otherwise, I wish you all the happiest of holidays and a happy new year and have a great weekend.